when you're buried in a box in a cemetery, you start recognizing the fact that you may die. You are talking about Holocaust level experiences in her ritual abuse, having been buried in the ground, starving, beaten, tortured, left to die. They did not report, they did not carry through, they did not believe her, they did not go the extra mile or even just the extra step to ensure that she was safe. I have never met anybody else from a clinical perspective that has had to endure the things that she had to endure as a child. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Imagine yourself as a small child born into a family of torture. You are alone, starved, neglected, and severely abused. There is no one to protect you as your parents, police, and teachers or the people abusing you. Your every action is monitored and controlled at home, at school, and in the community by this group of people. In order to survive this abuse, you learn to escape within yourself and create parts of you who hold the trauma. I first met Maddie about 30 years ago when she was a high school senior and living in foster care and an incident that uh, prompted the foster parents to believe that she might be suicidal brought her into the rape center for treatment and I was her therapist. Patty, I met her when I was 17 and I was living in a foster home at the time and um, I had actually come to a really low point and I just didn't feel that I had any reason to survive anymore. And so I, um, I actually laid down in the street and was hoping, it was the middle of the night and I was really hoping that a car would just come and run over me. I was in therapeutic foster care, and at that point they decided that I needed to see a therapist because that wasn't um, behavior that they wanted to see. She and another girl were being abused at school by a teacher, and someone walked in and saw that. And the teacher was arrested, ultimately tried, and sent to prison for a period of time. And that was the, the history of abuse that I knew initially. Over the course of treatment with her, I learned that there was much, much more to her history of abuse. I went and I sat there and I didn't talk because I knew until I turned 18, I couldn't, there wasn't anything. She was going to be a mandated reporter. It was going to get told to my parents. It was going to be worse for me. So after I turned 18, it took her two years to convince me that I could leave them without being killed because I was very convinced that I was going to be killed. It's very different to think about like being killed by somebody else versus killing yourself. Like, I don't know how that works, but there's, <laughs> it, it works very differently. In their mind, I was born for a certain purpose and I was never to leave. That, that was not in the plan. Her entire life was filled with abuse, not only, not only in her family of origin, but, but by people in the community, people um, who would ordinarily be considered resource people, people that would be safe to go to if you had a problem. There was law enforcement people that were abusive. There were people in the helping professions who were abusive. The teacher was abusive. Which was very dangerous, actually, for me because they blamed me and thought it was my fault that this happened. So they started putting me in hospitals and institutionalizing me to cover themselves and to make it look like I was crazy. For her, there were very few people in, in her life that she could count on to help her. So certainly trust was a huge issue for her. I think she came willingly to counseling when she came to see me at 17, 
but I think that she she didn't expect much out of it. I think she thought that it would be just one more horrible experience when either bad things happened to her or nothing good happened to her. It took a long time and a lot of work and therapy with her to be able to get to the point of, of leaving that. And I know that's hard for people to understand because I was an adult essentially when I turned 18, but yes, I, you know, I kept going back. After you've grown up like that, um, you feel that you have no choice, that the people that you love will be killed or murdered if you don't. You feel like your own life will be taken if you don't. I didn't know how to live in a world where I wasn't being told how to think. I didn't know how to make decisions for myself because decisions had always been made for me. I didn't know how to be in a relationship. Every single mammal needs to connect and have an attachment relationship. Otherwise, we'd all be sociopaths. So that need for attachment relationship becomes an internal trigger for the person with complex trauma. Because if I try and connect with you, I'm sure I'm gonna get abused. And so therefore, the drive to connect is actually in conflict with the drive to run away from connection. Trauma is uh, anything that, that happens to an individual that is frightening and scary and that might even make them feel like they're going to die as a result of the, some of these things that are happening. An individual can experience a trauma and they can, for instance, be in a plane crash and be a survivor of a plane crash or, or witness someone being murdered and that one incident can, can produce symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Complex trauma is something that happens over and over and over to, to someone. Children who live in homes where they're being abused and being tortured and being, being locked in, in a cage or being locked in a, in a box, that's complex trauma. And it's much more likely to produce severe symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder because it's happened over and over again and there's been no relief and no ability for them to recover from one trauma before another trauma happens. There would be times when I was, um, you know, isolated for long periods of time and I wouldn't have food or the comfort of a blanket or clothing time would go by, sometimes even a couple of days, they would bring me food. And I thought I was so loved because I was good enough to get that food. And that is how they started controlling me with something as simple as just basic needs, like giving me back my clothes so I could not be naked or providing me with the warmth of a blanket or giving me food. We most often hear the term post-traumatic stress disorder used in relationship to our soldiers who are returning from war. Those children who live in trauma also develop uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And we might see things like an exaggerated startle response where their emotions are always at a heightened level. In fact, sleeping and eating and, and bathrooming and all those kinds of things are kind of uh, difficult for those children because they're always up here and so one little thing can set them off. Simple PTSD is often an experience that has, we call it in the structural dissociation theory, one defensive action. So it's usually a safety theme. I'll give you a personal example. I had a horseback riding accident several years ago and even though I know logically it's over, I knew that the danger was over, when I would go to ride my other horse, I would start shaking, I would get this PTSD reaction. And until I healed that early experience of the horseback riding accident, my system was seeing this other horse as if it was the same situation. That's a simple PTSD incident. It's not related to attachment. It doesn't have to do with my family history. It's not internally confusing. It's literally, is it over? Is it not? Someone who has PTSD, for instance, if they're standing at the sink doing dishes and someone comes behind them and taps them on the shoulder, 
they fly into symptoms of anxiety because that threw them off. There's a, a hypervigilance. Those people who've experienced a great deal of trauma always feel unsafe. And so at nighttime, they may make the circuit around the house a hundred times, making certain that all the doors and the windows are locked. And they're always watching. They're, they're, they're sitting still is, is difficult for them because they're always looking out for danger. And always, if they hear a noise, they're always checking it out to make certain that they're safe. So complex PTSD is actually about when we have traumas, but at the hands of the individuals that are actually supposed to be our caregivers or in a caregiving role. So there's this internal conflict because you're the person that's supposed to take care of me, nurture and help me grow into becoming a human who feels safe in the world. But on the other hand, you are also the person who's abusing, neglecting, abandoning me. And so it creates this internal conflict. The analogy I often give is of a fence. So if we think about the qualities of just, a, a, say, a white picket fence, and think about this as a healthy attachment relationship, it's predictable, it's consistent, it has boundaries, it keeps unsafe things out, it keeps us safe on the inside. There's also a gate usually in the fence. You can go in and out in interactions with the folks who are your caregivers represented by the fence, but you are welcome back into the fold. So that's really the qualities of a healthy attachment relationship. So let's say in contrast, you are someone who experienced an electric fence as your caregivers. Sometimes it's on, sometimes it's off. Sometimes you get attuned to, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're gonna get a shock, sometimes you don't. So what happens is there's, again, what I call this push-pull internally. Do I go towards you? Do I go back? I don't know, it doesn't feel safe to connect with other people. It might feel safe to connect with people. So I don't know how I feel in terms of if my caregiver is okay to be in relationship with and attached to. When I was young and I was growing up, they'd often give me gifts. And um, just like any child, I was like really excited to get something. And I would interpret that as love. I thought that they were pro probably not gonna hurt me. Like it was, I was being good enough. I was being a good girl. One of the things they gave me was this handmade doll that resembled the old Cabbage Patch dolls. If you just look at them, they're dolls. And you know the Cabbage Patch doll was sweet and had brown hair and looked like her, which I think was intentional. And the Raggedy Ann doll, many children 35 years ago played with Raggedy Ann dolls. At first blush, they look like something that might have been a source of comfort for a child. What ended up happening after they let me have it for a few days is that it became part of the uh, sexual abuse. They would actually use a knife and make cuttings on my abdomen and my legs and places on my body. And they started like doing that on this doll um, in advance of doing it to me. So there's like this real anticipatory kind of like, oh, this is what's going to happen to me, but I could see it first and then it would be done to me. You could see that there were markings on the doll, especially the Cabbage Patch doll, that demonstrated where she was hurt. I wasn't in a place of being able to advocate for myself. I wasn't in a place of being able to ask for help. I didn't know what I needed. And a lot of times whenever, especially when you're an adult already, people make the assumption that you know how to do certain things and how to get the help that you need. And that's not always true. For me, I uh, was in an adult body, but my mentality and what I knew about how to live in the world, I was still a child. And I didn't have the skill set to be able to um, know what was available because I never had that. I've seen her grow and mature and learn coping skills and be able to work effectively at a very responsible job and raise a family, beautiful children, a beautiful family. She helped me learn to start trusting my own ability to make decisions. She started helping me like really basic skills about, just life skills about, um, you know, how to communicate 
needs, like basic needs that I had, how to go to the doctor and make doctor's appointments, how to balance having a job and a place to live on my own and safety. When you've lived a life like I lived, you become very vulnerable to the world, unfortunately. Um, and I was attacked at work one morning. It brought up all of my old stuff. I couldn't go to work anymore. I was hospitalized, I was self-harming. It opened up a whole lot of things I hadn't dealt with. I started working with this therapist. I didn't think anybody would want to work with me. And there was some truth to that. Not everybody is really comfortable with somebody who's been through extreme trauma or torture. A lot of people don't want to, people can absorb that energy, they, they are afraid of it. <laughs> so she was doing the best she could and she got me to a place where I could, I was functioning again, I could go back to work, um, you know, I could do the basic things, but I was still living in the cycle of abuse that had happened to me. Maddie was seeing a psychologist locally here a couple times a week and she, I remember that the psychologist contacted me via an email and heard about me. I was one of, I think back at that time, 12 art therapists in the state of Indiana and she realized Maddie was kind of stuck in her therapy with her and wanted her to um, utilize art therapy to help her in her process with her trauma. One of the pieces that Maddie created with me was this mandala. These um, eyes and all these little dolls are representative of the many personalities that she had due to the trauma she endured. And this has sat in my office for probably 15 years. She wrote, an image of me reflects back in the mirror, moving past the shame. Thank you for touching my life and for not rejecting us. You have taught me how to use art to express thoughts and feelings trapped inside. I will forever remember you. Will you remember me? The drive to attach has to exist but because of the emotional, spiritual, physical danger for someone like Maddie that she experienced, there's also the drive to not be in relationship with those individuals because they are also terrorizing. So what happens is there's this compartmentalization that her system built over time. And so it's what manifested for her as dissociative identity disorder. People who are diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder are, are able to compartmentalize the memories, the fears, the upsets into compartments. What they most often do is develop personalities. Those compartments become personalities. They may be very fragmented, very, very shallow personalities who may have only one small uh, chore that they do for the system. They may, for instance, make chocolate chip cookies, or they may deal with uh, having to cook, or they may deal with having to have sex with, with um, a father or a father figure. So there will be a part of self that is experienced as younger, but is not younger, that has the perspective that I need you to help regulate how I feel. I need you to rescue me, because that was an unmet need from childhood. At the same time, there will be a part of self that is defending against that part that's experienced as a child going, no, 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 we don't wanna connect. That's not safe because we know what happens when we try that. And so that then becomes more structurally dissociated. It becomes more neurologically hardwired in, part that demonstrates reaching for, part that banishes reaching for someone. And so that's how she survived her trauma, is to have parts that would have roles. What it looked like for me was having imaginary friends. So when I was really little and I was alone and I had nobody else with me to protect me and I, I didn't have any other 
person to talk to. I had created these parts of myself and then they just got very overly developed. And so instead of outgrowing imaginary friends, if you can think about it like that, they just became parts of myself that held pieces of my story because I couldn't be there like, and do the things that were being asked of me morally, like the things that were being asked of me to do were not within who I am. And I, there's no way I could have done those things. Um, and, but if I didn't do those things, my life was being threatened. Dissociative identity disorder is is a coping skill and and a very useful coping skill. One of the things she said to me very early on is I can't stay focused. I feel like I'm jumping around all the time. I don't remember certain things that people tell me that I've said or done. And she assumed that she was crazy. And I told her that her coping skills, her ability to dissociate was what kept her from going crazy. I had this vision of these, uh, creating these butterflies that I was going to send out away from me and that was going to be all the parts of myself that held all the different parts of the trauma. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, it was a beautiful vision and I was going to do this release ceremony and that stuff was no longer going to be a part of me. And so my therapist, she let me believe that for a while and uh, I kind of walked around with this like theory that this was all going to work. And then she gently started telling me, you know, this is part of you, this is, this is part of who you are. And I cried a lot. <laughs> I um, didn't know what I was going to do with that. That didn't fit with my vision. I thought about quitting therapy or finding a di different therapist because I was like, well, that's not working with what I want to do. And so um, then I realized that she was right. And so what was I going to do with that? I was like, well, that is just, you know, it's, it's a really fucking wrong deal, right? Healing is an ongoing process. It is not something that, that happens overnight or that happens and you can say, boy, am I glad that that's over. Healing means that you learn how to live with your reality. You learn how to develop the coping skills to get you through each day, to get you to feel safer and to be more comfortable and to, to be able to interact with other people and to be able to be an emotional human being that feels the things that you're supposed to feel and, and understands that sometimes that means that you feel things that are uncomfortable. Art therapy became my voice because I didn't have a voice. I didn't have words for what happened to me. Before, if you can imagine, like I was trying to communicate what happened to me so I could heal it, but I didn't have the words to go along. Not that I didn't know what happened to me because I knew and I had like a constant movie that was playing inside of me of like what had happened to me, but in order to try and feel like I could get it from inside myself to outside myself, I didn't know how to do that. It's about expression. It's about using their, the piece of artwork as a vehicle for their thoughts and their feelings and their emotions to be expressed. Um, that's why I always say, you know, art therapy doesn't give our, my clients a voice. It lets their voice be heard because traditional talk therapy methods is more kind of left hemispheric problem solving. Um, and what we know about art therapy is it's very right-brained. And so through the art therapy process, we are allowing the person to tell their story. They had certain dates that they had um, the full moon or the change of the seasons or holidays. Um, Halloween is a particularly very, um, that's like kind of a four day kind of uh, ritual that happens with these people. And um, often at the end of these, um, they had a wooden crate type box that they had built and um, a hole dug in the ground and they would have that box set down into the ground and you know had a lid opened up on the top and they would when they were done with me they would put me in there and um, that's where they would leave me. There's certain words that when you work with complex trauma you quickly hopefully discern take people out of their window of tolerance. So there are certain words that if Maddie heard them or if I had said them or they showed up that would immediately trigger uh, a high level of dissociation. 
And at that stage in her treatment where her part would take over her, she would just completely go offline, she'd lose time, and I'm trying to reorient her to current time. And one of those words is box. The amygdala is a jelly bean shaped mechanism in our brain. When we experience fear, our amygdala starts firing. So when we have trauma, when we have post-traumatic stress disorder, we go into fight, flight, or freeze mode. What the art therapy did was allow me to just draw and draw and draw, and it became my words until I then could learn vocabulary to go along with the images that I have. One of the great things about art therapy is that it can provide a really safe place for people to find themselves again. And then through choosing their art mater materials, choosing what kind of paper they want, the size, the color, the shape, um, they can become empowered. They can improve their self-confidence, self-esteem, self-awareness, and they can, they can use that process to feel more comfortable with telling their story and letting their, their voice be heard. They can actually change the physical and chemical structures of their brain, neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, making new neurons, making new dendrites. Art therapy is allowing them to explore visually and heal mentally. I remember artwork created, very dark artwork that was created about the box and the fear she had when she was placed in the box, often not knowing where she was, what city, what state she was in. It went through like all kinds of different things when I was in there, but I, I was really young when that started, extremely young. And I, um, you know, we have tantrums in there. I would, uh, cry and scream and then I would just feel like I was going to die. Every time it would happen I didn't know if I was gonna, um, if they were ever gonna come back for me. It's always very difficult with someone who has a high level of dissociation that closing the door, leaving the office is often the hardest time because that's when it feels like the most attachment breach. It feels like the most distressing uh, trigger for I'm leaving you and then it brings up the attachment related distress. So I would have a pattern where I would walk Maddie out from my office to her car to help her have that transition. I had done that, left for the day, I was actually at the barn with the horses in that evening, and Brian calls me and says, you need to come back to the office. Well, I'm Brian Sabatino, and I'm a counselor in the same office Sarah used to work in. One night I was walking out of the group room, and uh, I just saw Maddie sitting in this most convoluted posture under the chairs in the waiting room. I couldn't believe how she could be that flexible. And she was rocking and self-soothing, I think. She had uh, Sarah's business card spread out in some sort of ritual fashion. So I just tried to get her to come out from underneath the chairs and tried to explain who I was and see if she could figure out who she was and where she was and that sort of thing. But she would be really lost. I was just looking at her eyes, she wasn't there. The experience that Brian shared about Maddie being seen under a chair with my business cards laid out. So that is an example of her going into reliving. That is an example of her as adult. And that's an example of her losing time, which is associated with DID. A part of self had essentially taken her uh, adult perspective completely offline and was engaged in a behavior that was very similar to a behavior that occurred in her torture. I started working with a, a yoga therapist who did a lot of work with the body. She wanted to work with me doing yoga therapy to help herself heal from a complex PTSD and trauma. 
DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder, was something that was brought into my awareness during my first yoga therapy training. What I learned was the aspects of self potentially live in different parts of the body. And what yoga does is it helps us get into those parts of the body and then using therapeutic dialogue techniques, it gives a voice. Those aspects of self may have been fragmented due to trauma or due to other experiences in life that couldn't complete themselves. Maybe the person was too young, maybe they didn't have the resources and skills, so it created this tiny little knot in their energy system, in their nervous system and over time that built to become something bigger. So every time they would get triggered, maybe not by the same exact situation, but by something that replicated the experience of it or the energy of it, it flared the nervous system to respond in that way. So let's say they need to open into the shoulder, then we would dialogue with the energy of the shoulder. And so the person would give voice to the part of themselves that's living within their shoulder, and by that part of them finally being seen, being heard, and being witnessed from a place of unconditional positive regard, it no longer was in fear. And when a part of us is no longer in fear, we feel safe to then come back into what we call the wholeness of the heart. So the, one of the ways that I could help comfort myself and feel safe was to sit cross-legged and then fold over, so I was kind of sandwiched over, and um, as I I n never kind of outgrew that need to be able to comfort myself and feel safe. So even as I got out of the situation and I got older, I continued to find that the only way to, to comfort myself whenever feelings got too overwhelming, um, just general life things were difficult, I would go to that as kind of my go-to to feel safe in the world. I guided her into a pose that in yoga we call child's pose. and. For her, she shared with me that this is the position she slept in all the time. And that was the first time anyone had ever said that. When she was in that pose, she couldn't relax. Like her body was so bound and tight in the pose that we started getting curious and I would ask her questions or like, what are you noticing now? What are you aware of in your body? What sensations are you experiencing? And there were times where she could articulate what she was experiencing. And then there were times where she had no sensation in her body at all. And her mind was going into a flashback or a story. And in yoga therapy, we immediately guide back into the present moment and into a very subtle, safe experience of sensation in the body. And so that may have looked like, tell me about sensation in the bottom of your feet. What are you noticing on your hands on the ground? We tend to enter into a place that feels a little bit gentler than moving into where possibly some of the deeper traumas are stored in the body. So we titrate them, not flooding the system. It's like little digestible pieces of sensation over time increases their capacity to feel and then builds their resiliency to be with sensation without causing a trigger. One of the things that she was able to help me start doing through a lot of different yoga poses is to learn how to start feeling more comfortable stretching out, finding other comforts and props and using pillows and things like that to kind of surround myself so that I would still feel safe, but I would be starting to repair my hips and the pain that was being caused in my body from sleeping in that position, which isn't a normal sleeping position for a human. Once the story has been told, in yoga therapy, we don't want to have to re-experience or re-traumatize in any way, but we enter in through sensation in the body. And by using sensation in the body, they can increase their capacity to feel again. And really what happens is over time, the more safe they feel in their body, the easier it is for them to create a new story of healing. equine therapy in particular really worked with healing my emotional and spiritual self and being able to connect again so there's connecting with other but there's connecting even with myself and that's what 
the horses really helped me with. It totally changed where I'm at. I had no idea how much more alive I feel. I can feel wind on my face outside. I can feel the sun. Like I was so detached from my own self still, even after all that time. I didn't know that I could actually feel more ranges of emotions, more physical things. I could feel touch, finally. In addition uh, to providing psychotherapy in office, I also have created a protocol called Equine Assisted EMDR and I provide equine assisted EMDR therapy for folks who have complex trauma. I wanted to share with you just a little audio that she made. It'll describe the first day that she met me and it'll give you an idea about in 2011 where I was at. The image I have of you is I can see you sitting across from me. I'm in my leather chair, you're sitting on the couch across from me and your hair is kind of over your face and you're looking down at the ground and your breath is just super short. I mean, the I could feel the pressure in the room of how much intensity, how much anxiety was there about you being seen by me, by expressing what you needed to express in order to even get um, any kind of connection with the material that you were trying to share with me by your past. I knew that it was such a vulnerable thing for you to even walk in the door and then I would be giving you opportunities to get triggered all over the place by talking about these things. Um, I knew that you wanted something different, and I knew, you know, the horse world, we talk about um, horses having a lot of try, and I, even then I sensed that you had a lot of try in you, that you would really step into the work, even though it was difficult, um, because you'd survive so much. So in terms of doing the memory processing, what I also ascribe to is a theory, it's called, you know, we therapists love our acronyms, the Adaptive Information Processing Model. And this is the theory by which EMDR therapy, e eye movement desensitization reprocessing therapy, ascribes to. Long and short of it, the past drives the present. What is unhealed neurologically in the past drives current symptoms, current distress. I can't work on the memories and heal memories if my client, every cell, every molecule, every atom, every 100% of her doesn't realize that they're memory. I'm gonna make things worse. The people who had hurt me the most were human beings. And so it was really hard, even if it was a nice person, for me to trust them because they were just another person. But there was something about the horse that I could connect with that felt very authentic and real. And I started being able to really have a drive to want to connect in a different way than I'd ever felt before. having the horse in partnership with the client to help facilitate EMDR is the way to do clinically sound trauma therapy, but still enable the horse to be the way to really support the client's dual attention in all phases of EMDR. It gives me a better chance as a therapist to get traction. Because if you think about complex trauma being, ah, you're a human, you hurt me, mom hurt me, <laughs> you're gonna hurt me too. What, as a therapist, who, who am I to think they're gonna have a different attachment relationship with me? They're gonna demonstrate that same dissociative process with me, and they should, because that's where they learned it, was in interpersonal relationship. So you're guiding their eyes with your fingers. You literally have to activate the memory in a very conscious, mindful way a certain way of lighting up that neural network, and you've had to have a lot of stabilization to do that. Because if people start just doing the eye movements like that, they're missing that EMDR is not an intervention, it's a literally therapeutic process. So the equine assisted EMDR portion of this is that you're doing EMDR, but it's in facilitation with the horse supporting the client being able to maintain the dual attention necessary to do the processing in the first place. It actually completely changed my life and I credit like working with the horses to like bringing life to me. Um, you know, you don't know what you 
don't have until you actually have it, which is really hard because um, it's hard to reach for something that you don't know can be there a possibility for you. There was a whole nother level of being able to ask for really in-depth emotional needs that I hadn't been able to do yet that I learned through horses. People want to know the direct path to get to where I'm at today. And it's not prescriptive like that. Everybody has their own journey. I've tried a lot of different therapies and all of them were right. The mantra that I say to myself all the time right now is like one body, one mind, one heart, one person. All of the different therapies that I have worked with have kind of led me to getting myself back to the one person that I've always been, but I felt so fragmented and so separate from myself. It takes a lot of patience to work with somebody who's really traumatized. And if you're going to move towards trying to help, or you're going to say that you do work with people who have trauma, you have to know there's a time commitment and it's not going to be fast on your part either. It's gonna be hard, it's gonna be difficult. You're not always gonna understand where that person's coming from. And it's a big commitment to make to say that you're going to work with them. I'm always, always paying attention to that dissociative process. It, it literally is moment to moment, second to second, checking to see if her system is going outside of its window of tolerance. And what that really means is, are, is she going into reliving and hypervigilance? Or is she going into shutdown, which is another form of reliving, but going into that hypo arousal? And it's, it's a teeter-totter. Coming out of the box means challenging her entire belief system that from her perspective enabled her to endure the box in the first place. My husband's role in her life is I think played a very important role because he was able to, to uh, demonstrate to her what a healthy adult male is like in the life of a child in a relationship with an, another adult, a female, and how a healthy adult male would fulfill their obligations and responsibilities to their family. And they've forged a very healthy, a very strong relationship. And I think that she thinks of him very much as a, a father figure, and certainly he thinks of her very much as a daughter. I can't imagine how few people know about how folks like Maddie suffer. Uh, stuff we could never even comprehend and and the, the degree to which she had to come back it's correct because emotional is thinking of it we need to be talking about these things we need to be talking about these things with our teachers we need to be talking about these things with pediatricians we need to be talking about these things at our churches we need to be talking about these things with our girlfriends and with our neighbors we need to be talking about these things. Yeah, I, I think it's just important for people who, who work with people or people who have been traumatized to know that there is hope down the road because when I first saw her, she had no hope. I truly believe that people need to feel hope to heal. It's so empowering for me to see someone um, take such horrendous experiences and then be willing to give humans a chance again our humanity is our divinity, and when we allow our sufferings to then help another person heal, there becomes meaning. And when we can make meaning out of suffering, then it feels like there's purpose. The, the truth is, this is all that I have that I can give back, I feel like, is to help people better understand what it's like to go through circumstances like I have. And I almost feel, I guess, a responsibility to to do that, and not for myself, but for my friend that didn't make it and didn't ever get to have her voice heard or her story told, and the many other people out there that don't survive the circumstances like I went through. It is your mind, it is your body, 
you know, it is your heart and soul. We can bring compassion, we can have loving kindness, uh, even in the torturous experiences, and know that it's okay to live. Yeah. 